I'm Jason Lewis. And I'm Thomas Mills. Welcome to Climate Optimus. As a couple concerned citizens, we're on a journey to explore climate solutions and ways each of us can make a difference. So Flora is out this week adventuring, I've heard, in, in Portugal. Not, not that we're jealous, uh, but she'll be back for our, uh, our next episode. We wish her well. So as a uh, nonprofit organization, it's donations from our listeners that, that enable us to educate and empower people to become climate advocates. So whether you're a longtime listener or just discovered us and you like what you hear, consider a donation that aligns with that value. Donating is easy. Just head over to our website, climateoptimist.co, and click the donate button. But if you're not ready to take the step of becoming a donor, but do want to help out, tell your friends about us and rate us on your favorite streaming platform. So fast fashion, for those who aren't familiar, is effectively a business model implemented by the fashion industry to sell more product. It relies on you know cheaper garments tied to the latest trends and have those garments be fast to market and then sold at much higher volumes. Thomas is a fashion influencer there in Australia. You must know all about fast fashion. <laughs> yeah, I know. I can't believe you and I are speaking about fashion. When we're probably the least fashionable people that ever existed. <laughs> hey, speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Lewis, I've seen what you wear. <laughs> you know, maybe that's maybe it's for the better. We're we're not emotionally attached to the topic. We can be more more objective. Um, oh, right. As one can easily imagine, fast fashion comes with some significant environmental consequences. the The industry at large is already you know carbon, chemical, and and water intensive, and you know over the years has been plagued by poor labor practices. And fast fashion has really magnified all of that. Between just the period of, of 2000 and 2015, the number of garments being produced has nearly doubled from around 50 billion a year to 100 billion. So today we're going to be digging into the topic in more detail, the climate impacts, other environmental problems, and of course, what we can do about it. But uh, before we explore the world of fast fashion, uh, let's get to uh, this week's reason for hope. Yeah, in a uh, unanimous ruling, Hawaii's Supreme Court is allowing Honolulu's climate change case against eight fossil fuel companies to move forward. Back in 2020, uh, the city and county of Honolulu filed a suit uh, alleging that these companies had deceived the public about the dangers of fossil fuels. And the lawsuit seeks damages that the city and county are facing as a result of climate change. And in April, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court rejected the request to move the case uh, to federal court. And now with this ruling, uh, the case will be allowed to move to trial. Most of them didn't respond or make any public comment on this. Um, but Shell said in a statement, we do not believe the courtroom is the right venue uh, to be addressing climate change, which is kind of hilarious because they haven't seemed to want to address it anywhere else. So I'm still trying to work out where is the right venue to be doing this otherwise. <laughs> um, but anyway, it's great to see that there will be some repercussions and hopefully like the the Volkswagen diesel gate scandal, they you know, end up putting a few executives behind bars for a while. Yeah, I think you're right that that's really what it's going to take to change behavior because at this point, you know, there really haven't been a lot of consequences for these folks. And, you know, you want to talk about the, the impact of the diesel gate scandal. I mean, let's talk about the impact climate change is having on all of us. So our, our guest today to help us explore the topic of fast fashion is Kate Fletcher. She is a professor at both the Royal Danish Academy in Copenhagen and also the Oslo Metropolitan University in Norway. She is one of the most cited scholars in fashion and sustainability and has written and or edited about 12 books. Kate's the co-founder of the Union of Concerned Researchers in Fashion, and her most recent work is about design, clothing, and nature. Kate, welcome to Climate Optimus. Thank you. A pleasure to be here. So to start things off, when it comes to efforts to address climate change, what makes you hopeful? I guess that maybe what makes me hopeful are both big things and small things, often in combination. I guess that it's things that people do, practices, 
ideas, understanding, imagination. And most of the time, these have to be in relationship with each other, sort of vibrating at a different frequency than all the ideas and things that we've had to this point. I guess most of us would probably agree with Einstein when he's famously said, or maybe I'm paraphrasing, uh, that we can't solve the problems with the same type of thinking that created them. And so what makes me hopeful is when people start thinking and doing in new ways, because that's the sort of thing that we need to engage with. Yeah, I like that. Well, for folks who may not be super familiar with our topic today, can you explain a little bit what what fast fashion is? Yes, of course. So fast fashion is at the top, a business model, nothing more. It's a business model that's based on low price and high volume. And it's often touted as many other things, but simply it's a business model. We created it and we can and do create other things. It's only really been in existence for about 30 years in the format that we see at the moment. And that it's taken off is because it's an extremely successful business model. Of course, uh, that's at high cost to uh, lots of environments and contexts and climate uh, indicators and people all over the world. But ultimately, that's what it is, just a business model. And so you, you kind of started to touch on it there briefly, but you know, let's talk about why this sort of rapid pace of you know, more clothing on the market and switching and so forth is, is so problematic for the environment and, you know, as well for climate change? Well, I guess it's sort of obvious that if we're buying more and in the fast fashion context, that's considerably more than we did before, then impacts are going to go up. So some of the figures and nothing is very precise because in the fashion space, the data is extremely unreliable. There's huge biases and vested interests that have been part of the development of the data sets that we have. So at the moment, we have like this broad spectrum where we think that between 2% and 10%, so somewhere in that range of global greenhouse gas emissions are from the fashion and textile sector. What we think at the moment is that emissions, and I think my memory says me right, it's the UN that is forecasting this, that emissions from the fashion sector are expected to surge by 50% by 2030. Uh, we are already looking at the number of items that people are buying per year, uh, doubling uh, since uh, the beginning of this millennium, and that they're expected to surge an additional 50% by 2030. And then other people are saying that by 2050, the projections are that fashion sector, so this is the industrial sector of fashion and all the things that people do with the clothes in their homes, this will use more than a quarter of the world's carbon budget by 2050. Um, so wow. these are all really, really big numbers. I mean, the, the last two are forecasts, but the first one is more uh, about sort of the rough idea that we have of the impact of this sector. And then there's this sort of side argument in all of this, which is, again, sort of obvious. So if you go into what's called a fast fashion store, so one of the stores that have low prices and sell in volume, often you could sort of tell by the way that things are sort of piled up inside these stores. So then if you looked at the labels to look at what the fabric was made from, almost entirely these uh, these fabrics will be made from, from oil-based fibres, so synthetic fibres. The plastics industry is now seeing fabrics, textiles, and other sort of soft goods like this as the key outlet for the production of, of oil polymers. So some of the big oil companies have been very clear about their shifting now from produ producing oil uh, for use in petrol and gasoline, and now moving it instead to the production of polymers, including for use in clothing. So a key part of this story of uh, increasing carbon impacts in this sector is the increasing 
uh, plasticization, if that's a word, polymerization, <laughs> polymerization based on fossil fuels of this sector. Yeah, and we've, you know, we had a recent episode where we talked about plastics in general, and um, it is it is pretty amazing to see the investment of the fossil fuel companies and how hard they're pivoting in that direction. So what kind of, for people who aren't familiar with textiles, I mean, what sort of fibers are we talking about when we're talking about oil-based fibers? Yeah, no, that's a really important question. So if maybe take a tiny step back. So if you look across uh, the piece in general, so at the moment, 60% of world fiber demand is made in polyester. So polyester is a fiber that's made into things like often like sportswear, sports t-shirts, shorts, into fleece jackets, for instance. And also it's blended very heavily into lots of other products. There are other fibers that are used also, uh, made from fossil fuels in textiles commonly, including, I guess, that most people would recognize nylon, um, as a common term. Yeah. And then there are other other fibers like the ones that give stretch uh, to clothing, elastane, it's branded variously as things like lycra. And that is also made from fossil fuels. The broader picture, of course, is not without impacts. I wouldn't want anyone to take away from this that other fibers have no impact. That's plainly not true at all. Uh, we have two, we have three broad categories of fibers in the textile space. We have the synthetic ones that I've just described. Then we have a bunch of natural fibers, uh, which include things like cotton and wool and linen. I think uh, cotton is well known for having high impacts for high use of pesticides in its growth. It is a thirsty crop if grown in the wrong conditions needs irrigation. Although that said, most cotton the world over is uh, fed by uh, rain, rainwater, rain fed rather than irrigated. And it has been associated in the past with, for example, the shrinking of the Aral Sea, where there was high amounts of cotton cultivation. Other natural fibres like wool and linen and hemp also draw down resources. Everything draws down resources and they do this in different right. ways. And what we generally find is that while synthetic fibres are high in terms of energy consumption, uh, natural fibres tend to be higher in water consumption and so it's a trade-off somewhere uh, and then there's another bunch of fibers which are called regenerated fibers which are basically made from uh, trees and then chemically reduced and then remade into fibers and that's uh, that's all the fibers like viscose for instance uh, sit into that category so we have we have a sort of a basket of options and uh, across the piece, we would perhaps say, if I was going to stick my neck out, I would be putting uh, hemp and wool at the beginning of that list in terms of overall compatibility with living well. And most of the time, I think that what we need to do is not just think purely in terms of like impacts as we're able to measure them, but in terms of what sort of garment is produced at the end of the day. And actually, you know, are we going to want to wear it? Right. So it, it sounds like, obviously, when you're selling a cheaper garment, um, you know, worksmanship sounds like isn't something that's valued as much because it's, you know, you're, you're not having to put as much uh, effort, if you will, into creating that garment. I mean, is it fair to say that if we were sort of to go in the reverse of kind of fast fashion, where we have really kind of thinking like well-built, durable garments that are designed to last that that in turn, you know, would mean people would take better care of them and, you know. If only that was the case. Sadly, it's not the case. Um, it is it is more complicated. So if we take polyester, this fibre that's commonly found in the cheapest garments, it, when you're going into a store and paying for something, they're commonly found in the cheapest garments. Uh, the common misconception is that polyester isn't going to last but actually, in terms of its potential durability, it will outlive us all. Uh, it is, <laughs> or, you know, it will not break down. So it's not, it's not what people want, but it's extremely durable. And it's not always the case that when you pay a high price that the piece is well made. I think we certainly know that when you pay a low price, the worker isn't being appropriately remunerated. 
and some environments somewhere will be experiencing the detrimental effects of the production of this garment. But it doesn't follow that when you pay a high price that the worker is well remunerated and that no environments are polluted. So it's like it's not we're in a really murky territory. It's also the case that what we've discovered is when you're sort of promoting durability as a solution uh, to these sorts of problems, we realise that actually it's not a solution in the sorts of situations that we find ourselves in. In the real life of the global north, where we are already used to just buying more than we need when we want it, however we want it, it's something like 10% of purchases are made as a replacement for something that's worn out. And the rest of the time, we're buying them for lots of different reasons, because we like it, because there was a sale on. So it's almost never that the reason is because something's worn out and we're buying something new to replace it. So instead, what we find is, is that people um, like to hold on to garments. They like to have more than they need. And in, in that sort of context, Designing for durability isn't in any way going to to tackle the big challenge and the big challenge that maybe we haven't been like nailed up like explicitly here is is one of too much. It's one of of volumes being far greater than the planetary limits can can withstand. It's of appetite being far too great. I mean, we all need to rather be talking perhaps about fast fashion. We need to be talking about less fashion which is a deeply unpopular but essential part of this story. Yeah, I mean, you've hit on something I think that we talk about, you know, from time to time that is kind of this, to your point, underlying and not really popular thing, which is that, you know, those of us in the developed world are just consuming too much and that has a drain, you know, on resources and obviously generates a lot of carbon emissions as well. So durability isn't a quick solution. Although in my my simplistic mindset that was seeming like something, what <laughs> what do you what do you see as potential solutions to move away from this current model that we that we have to achieve something that's that's more sustainable and aligned with you know what we have available in terms of resources? So I guess that if we're going to shrink the sector and take responsibility for doing that, recognizing that it's not all people in all quarters that need less. Some people who currently have far lower material opportunities than others will and should have more. So it's bringing some people up while those in the global north who generally speaking are in a space of too much can begin to reduce without damaging in any way standards of living or quality of life. And then it's about redirecting our efforts elsewhere. So If we're going to be thinking about what we can do, I guess the idea is we would start thinking about distinctiveness and fashion opportunities more locally. So recognising that what we have at the moment isn't serving us, the workers or the planet. And actually what we need to do is something profoundly different. And this might be a clothes swap. Uh, These are things that are happening already it's not like a big leap going in and sharing clothes other times maybe we get together perhaps in a local library or a skill sharing place and we can make uh, or repair uh, pieces ourselves most of the time you can repair clothing with a needle and thread and a pair of scissors it's handy to have a, a sewing machine but it's not necessary so these sort of sensibilities of of problem finding like looking to understand what the issue is how can I fix it and then setting to and repairing it are the really key essential ingredients of the sort of society that I think a climate optimist wants to live in going forward so I'm thinking of a couple things I mean it sounds like you know this the idea of exchange gives the opportunity for however that's occurring for people to get new things and feel like their, you know, their warm grove is circulating. It isn't sort of static. And, you know, you're talking about the repair piece. None of these seem like things that you need sort of legislation to deal with, or are, are there legislative things that could happen that could help move us in sort of this different direction that you're talking about? 
Yeah, and I'm actually really glad that you mentioned sort of novelty there because novelty is a big part of the fashion story. Uh, uh, this um, this this looking for change and engaging with it. Uh, I think it's also important that we begin to see that like the most radical fashion piece is one that we already own rather than necessarily something that we go out and buy, and we can reimagine it in in different ways. And this all of this does require legislation. Absolutely, because how else are we going to call the industry to account for the sorts of behaviours that are, are in place today? Most of the other scenarios that always get mentioned are things like the circular economy. People go, don't worry, don't worry. We can, we can just introduce the circular economy and providing that we find a way to recycle all of the goods that we're producing will be fine. But I am afraid that I am a pessimist about about that as a scenario, largely because we in the the clothing and fashion space we're not confronting closed loop. A closed loop isn't possible here. It's an open loop, and also it takes a huge amount of energy, some of which can be electrified and powered by renewables. I accept that, but not all of it. It also is seemingly never mentioned the logistics of getting things in the circular economy the idea is that you you get back things that have been discarded and make them into something new in order to sell them again and keeps this cycle going but the logistics of doing that are not free they're very difficult to electrify fully and so we do need legislation i'm not saying that the circular economy doesn't have a place or more accurately recycling doesn't have a place it absolutely does Repair, reuse, recycling absolutely has a place in this, but it needs to be directed to the part of the system where it's going to be most effective. And that's not the total solution. And so that's where we need legislation to come in. The EU is drafting legislation in this space at the moment, and it goes uh, along the lines of the circular economy argument and sort of spread out in in different ways, looking looking to try to regulate different fibre types and other things. But I think a new swathe of legislation will come in about extending the responsibility of producers to uh, to handle uh, garments after they've they're no longer wanted and a raft of other things. So, in terms of so the idea of circularity obviously you know comes with benefits. It sounds like the challenge is making that work. You know, practically speaking, I think what I heard you say is you know one of the things legislatively that needs to happen. We call it extended producer responsibility here. I'm not sure if they call it in the UK, but but where you would make the, you know, these fashion companies responsible for taking back their their garments and end of life. Is that one of the sort of vehicles to sort of push this in the right direction? Maybe, but not in the format that it's currently organized. I don't think that the circular economy is only just a, a problem that it's not sort of figured out the logistics and and the technology quite yet. I think there's also something embedded in it as an idea where it's not critical of the volume uh, of production. I guess that it's incumbent on the circular economy not just to churn at the same speed more and more stuff, or even at greater speeds, but actually also to reduce um, the amount produced. So the circular economy has, as I understand it, little critique of of the idea of more, it just keeps on increasing the potential for it. But the extended producer responsibility idea has uh, legs, I think we would say, but I guess that at the moment, maybe it's been conceived of in a slightly wrong way. There's a group of my colleagues uh, in, um, in Norway from Oslo Met University who have been doing an experiment with what they call a picking analysis. So as you may know, when clothing's, clothing is discarded, it goes, uh, we hope, um, to a place where it can be sorted before it's then either sent for uh, resale uh, or recycling. But this picking analysis means that people in this waste sorting center then go through and see, look and identify um, the garments that are there by their label, looking to see if the brand label is in there. 
and working out the constitution, the material makeup of each of the garments. And on the back of that, what they understand is certain sorts of brands uh, that are being discarded more than others and certain fibres that are being discarded more than others. And at the moment, the extended producer responsibility is not based on knowledge of actually the sorts of things that are thrown away. But with this new missing piece of the, the, the picture, we can actually start to inform legislation so that those sorts of brands and those materials are charged at a higher rate. So there's more tax effectively paid on those things because we don't want those things to be discarded at that rate, at that speed. So these sorts of things are trying to inform that legislation. So basically gathering some of that that data that you're talking about that's hard to get on the back end to understand, you know, hey, this this particular, I'll say, you know, polyester thing is is discarded at a much higher rate. So we want to correct the economic model by putting a higher price on that to disincentivize that sort of behavior going forward. Yeah. Is that... And yes, exactly. And it's trying to make evidence-based policy. And, you know, we're talking about policy here and I know that can, you know, get too much in the weeds for some folks, but where do the, you know, clearly it's necessary, but where do the brands sit in all of this? Are there, you know, members of the industry that recognize that there's a problem and are you know helping with this transition there's a whole mix as you can imagine there's some people who are absolutely on board and are seeing this as totally a shared responsibility looking for for ways to um, modify to pivot their businesses in new ways to continue to provide livelihoods whilst also reducing impacts there's some people are refusing to talk about anything other than eco-modulation, as we call it in Europe. So this sort of like um, polishing small details, small tweaks, uh, small improvements to products and things. Other people are prepared to take the conversation much further, recognising that um, it's it's a shared responsibility. And, you know, without without the planet, there's, there's no people on there. It certainly isn't a fashion industry. Right. Well... You know, you're listening to this, understand that it sounds like there's some very big structural changes that need to take place that enable us to move away from, you know, sort of this model of high volume and discarded end of life to one that is, you know, lower volume where things are recycled, reused, you know, exchanged, et cetera. Where do, you know, where do we fit into all this, right? Where do individuals fit into all of this as consumers and, you know, as growing number of folks who are concerned about the climate, the environment, how can we help, you know, manifest this change? Yeah, I mean, it it is uh, true that sustainability um, is a political problem. Uh, It's about structural choices. And often it's being framed as it's about consumers and consumer choices alone. And I would really want us as consumers, I'm a consumer, like I guess everyone who's listening to this, to make us realise that it's not consumers' fault alone. It is definitely a shared responsibility between consumers, producers, the media, the fashion, the fashion influencers, the whole piece, you know, it's a it's a shared responsibility across the board. But it the uh, making this into something that it's about consumers exclusively is for me really deeply problematic. It's like individualizing what is a collective problem. That said, what we do as consumers really matters. It sets the tone for how we live our lives. So I guess the main thing to do is to buy less, uh, to ask yourself, is this something that I really like? Most of the time we're going, yeah, 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 yeah. But inside there's something about the piece that we're like, mm, not really sure about that. I think I've got something similar at home. To ask ourselves that question and to an- answer honestly. Then the obvious things about seeing if you can buy this uh, secondhand uh, makes sense and all. And then the other thing that's often um, items that are never worn are those that are gifts. So not buying for other people things that you think they would like. It sounds like similar to the oil industry trying to cast the problem as individuals with a carbon footprint. There's a similar analogy with, you know, fashion and consumers that consumers are the problem. It sounds like we can be 
more astute consumers and that helps. Are there things that we can do to help with the broader system change aside from our, you know, our consumption habits? Like, you know, do we need to be lobbying our government? What sort of things do we need to be asking for? Yeah, we do need to be lobbying government without a doubt. I guess we also need to be mobilizing ourselves in different ways. I um, am part of a project uh, which is called Earth Logic. Uh, it's a fashion action research plan and it's free to download at earthlogic.info. Uh, and it's a very radical take on maybe what we need to do. And one of the big themes within Earth Logic is to try to uncover the potential of governance in new ways. So if we accept that we've already got sort of enough clothes the challenge going forward is not about making more but it's about organizing ourselves differently it's about regulating and distributing the sorts of stuff that we've already got in new and different ways and this is a problem of governance and here i mean governance like with a small g not a capital g not big government not gov it's not right, something right. that happens in london or washington or canberra um but something that happens like in communities in households we already govern ourselves on a daily basis. You know, we're too hot, we take off a layer. We're cold, we put one on. We're governing ourselves. We govern how much we eat. We govern how we spend our time. And then recognizing that this also, we have this facility and capacity. And we can also share and distribute resources locally by activating governance in new ways. So. It is important that we lobby. It is important that we act at that bigger level. And it's also important that we recognize that we have many roles to play in society and not just as consumers. We are much more powerful than that. I like that. Well, Kate, uh, certainly a complex topic. It sounds like, though, there, there are, are lots of places where we have an opportunity to improve and places where all of us can plug in. So folks need not be sort of deterred by you know, the magnitude that it's about getting involved in and finding a, a place where you can be a part of it. But thanks for coming in and talking to us about it. Uh, thanks for all the work you do in the space. And uh, yeah, I hope, hope we see some more improvement over the next few years. Thank you. So not that I had a big, you know, body of knowledge when it came to fast fashion or fashion in general, but it was obviously great to have a chance to, to talk with Kate. She's obviously extremely knowledgeable when it comes to the topic. And, you know, one of the things to me that sort of stood out was when she talked about, you know, sort of this greater reality that I know we've talked about on the podcast, which is that we need to be consuming less, right? And whether that's fast fashion or, you know, any number of other things, we just can't continue to sort of sustain the rate of consumption that, that we have been in, in the developed world. I mean, you talk about the United States and the fact that if you'd sort of look at our, the impact of our consumption, it's, it's roughly, you know, it'd take about five planet Earths to sustain us if everybody were to live like us, you know, versus like a, you know, most African countries are more like a half of an Earth. So, yeah, I think, you know, we're talking obviously about fast fashion, but I think there is this greater theme that, that it's important for us to, you know, call out and recognize, which is that fundamentally our problems with climate change and biodiversity and these other crises are, have their roots in many ways in, in the volume of consumption that we're doing. And looking at, um, you know, different data from the, around the world, it doesn't really matter whether you look at the EU or Australia, it looks like there's about 15 kilograms of textiles that are purchased per year uh, per person with where it seems to be sort of a, a 50 50 split between household textiles and that purely for clothing. But the thing that sort of led to this increase, it seems apparent, is our ability to make this clothing cheaper and cheaper, either through the use of cheap fossil fuel based fabrics or because we've improved manufacturing processes, better sewing machines, whatever it might be to put this gear together. But that sort of indicates to me that, well, part of the way of solving this consumptive problem is. Maybe we need to increase the price of this. And that's where I, I see taxation has a role. Like in my mind, taxation serves a pur purpose of raising revenue to provide you know, basic services for the public, but also it can be really good at encouraging people to make the right consumptive behaviors. 
Yeah, or as you always mention, you know, I mean, a carbon tax wouldn't hurt, at least when it comes to the, you know, all the polyester garments, right? It's all of a sudden that stuff gets more expensive and, you know, you can't afford to be constantly going out and, and buying whatever, you know, fits the, the latest fashion trend. And and hopefully that would lead to people then buying better clothing. Like, I mean, <laughs> I, for example, have a polyester jacket on right now, right? But I've owned this jacket for seven years and I wear it pretty much every day and it's extremely durable. But it's a fact that we're, we're building this clothing that is super lightweight, not particularly durable. If you just build it that little bit heavier, a little bit more durable, and then I think we need to look at end of life, like what do we do with it? If it really is that worn out, well, that, then that's where we need to maybe look at pyrolysis, where we can basically break those plastics down into their most basic form so it can then be used to replace oil feedstocks that would otherwise need to be sucked out of the ground. Yeah, and you're, and you're hitting on a key point there, which is that you know if we fundamentally want to reduce the footprint, if you will, resources, carbon or otherwise with the fashion industry, it's about reducing, you know, our need for for virgin feedstock, right? Whether that's cotton or polyester or other, you know, natural fibers, and and that starts with being able to recycle the garments that we have today, right? So hopefully we're we're getting the most out of them, you know, and and throughout their life. But when they do get to the end of life, it's got to be key for us to be able to, you know, to recycle these these goods and and then reduce our need for additional feedstock, you know. And on top of that, I think. Getting to uh, getting to a place where we're you know looking at other business models altogether, right? I you know it's hard to say how things are going to shake out exactly, but you've had a you know over the last few years you know being able to rent the runway where people go out and rent something you know for a you know a, a big event that they otherwise would have to go out and purchase. Maybe there's an opportunity to extend that into you know further into our wardrobes where you know for folks who want that variety and don't want to wear the same type of shirt they do all the time like I do <laughs> that they have access to to different clothing and it becomes you know more of a subscription model right rather than just this idea of like we have to own it and have it sitting in our closet because you know even as somebody who doesn't have a lot of clothes I can vouch for the fact that there's stuff that you know probably needs to move on to somebody else who can who can better use it because I'm not using it enough and and I think if if some of these manufacturers could um step up and try and create a culture where it is acceptable to have patches on your clothes, to have things that are repaired. You know, it's funny that every now and again, it becomes trendy to have jeans that are like ripped in the knee. And so maybe it's like, well, we should be getting grandma's sewing machine out and, and putting a patch on that piece of clothing. And, and that's something that's acceptable and promoted by these organizations. You know what will happen. They'll end up selling your jeans with patches already on the knees, but it that would at least be a move in the right direction for sure i think you're right and you know i think uh kate spoke to this a little the the reality is it doesn't take a ton of skill to be able to do basic mending right and you know that's one of the other things that that's a potential lever we can pull is you know being able to remove barriers for companies that are doing you know doing repairs and and getting people those skills again right because we go back a generation. I mean, that was sort of standard practice. Everybody repaired their their garments when they, you know, had a button pop off or or a tear. And for you know, when a piece of clothing really does get to end of life, there is a secondary life for natural fibers. Um, you know, this work I, I do in energy efficiency, I come across quite often cellulosic insulation that is basically like blue jeans and maybe shredded newspaper that is mixed with boric acid to make it non-flammable um, that's pumped into ceiling cavities and makes a, a good, you know, relatively natural uh, insulation layer. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems like clearly fast fashion is a, is a big problem, you know, from both a climate, you know, and related resources perspective. But it does seem like there are a number of, you know, potential levers we can pull. And so I, I guess I'm I'm somewhat or maybe cautiously optimistic that, that this is something that can be, you know, addressed with some thoughtful legislation. You know, I did ask uh, Kate Gardner, a sustainability expert who we've had on the podcast before, about her thoughts in terms of where you go if you do want to buy a garment, you know, to make sure you're buying from a company that is, you know, more sustainability minded. And, you know, unfortunately, it's still the same handful of companies 
out there, you know, that are really showcasing sort of the repair, regear, and upcycled offerings. And it's like the, you know, Arcteryx, REI, Patagonia, Levi's, Eileen Fisher. And, you know, while it's great that they're doing these things and we should absolutely be buying from those companies when we can, we do need, as you put it, more, you know, traditional fashion and textile companies to to step up, you know, in supporting the resale of their goods and implementing repair models to extend the life of products and and upcycling. So this stuff doesn't end up in the landfill. And and this is where I think like legislation really needs to step in. Um, so we basically take, well, what is the best model right now in the industry and how do we legislate that? So that's at least the floor for everybody else. And we take what's going on in the EU right now where they're, they're basically clamping down on the export of poor quality secondhand you know, use textiles to countries that end up with it just as a waste stream that ends up, you know, causing pollution in their own local environments. And and so if we can then force those companies that would otherwise be exporting those materials to make more effort to put them back into local circulation again, or if they really are at end of life, you know, dispose of them responsibly, i.e. recycle those products. And and I think that that can be done too through an industry based levy. We we see that already um, in Australia. If you're a farmer and you buy a chemical drum, then there's a deposit that's paid on that, so that it is free to have that drum collected, melted down, recycled, made back into another drum in the future. Or similarly with tires, where in many parts of the world, if you buy a new car tie, there might be a a $10 levy um, for the disposal of your prior one. And that is a mandatory thing for everybody to implement. Yeah. And and it seems like the EU is really setting the bar at this point with their extended producer responsibility legislation. And obviously it'd be great to see that, you know, move its way over into places like the US and Australia where, where, where there isn't a, you know, an incentive to ensure that, that materials get back into the loop, right? That they're not just going to landfill and worse, you know, being sent abroad to to be somebody else's garbage. So, you know, as always, as folks know, on this podcast, we try to ask ourselves with any, you know, issue we're facing related to climate, what can we do? And this week, we have two recommendations. Uh, The first is, you know, for the folks who are outside the EU, where you already have extended producer responsibility, we want you to email your representatives and tell them we need to, to pass it. It not only helps address waste on the fashion side, but you know, electronics, packaging, et cetera. And, you know, we'll have talking points on our website. If, if we can get extended producer responsibility in place in the U.S. and Australia, it would be huge. And I think the other side of it is like only buy what really excites you, buy good quality gear that you know is going to last and you know you want to wear again. And then, you know, when that gear is worn out, don't be frightened to have a crack at repairing it. The jacket I'm wearing right now, um, the zipper went on it and I sewed a new one on six months ago and it's still going great and will probably be going great for many years to come. And and it's, you know, with YouTube videos and things like that available these days, it's not hard to learn how to how to thread up a sewing machine and, and do something as simple as stitching on a new zipper. Thomas, it sounds like I need to enlist you because the last zipper repair I had done was, was definitely not that good. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks to everybody for for tuning in to this week's episode. We'll be taking off the week of Thanksgiving. So our our next episode will be coming out Tuesday, November 28th. If you haven't yet, uh, take a moment to sign up for our monthly newsletter. Um if you're already a subscriber, you know, tell your friends and show them where to sign up. Climate Optimus is made possible by Climate Stewards Collective. You can find us on the web at climateoptimist.co and don't forget to follow us on social at Climate Optimist Podcast. 